right. Uh, I would say uh, we start off uh, with my talk about uh, context maps. Um, just a quick question. Who uh, read one of the uh, chapters about context maps in either the blue or the red book? Who thought that they absolutely understood it in the first place when they read through it? <laughs> Not even me, <laughs> no. Um, actually, I think um, looking back um, about, well, myself getting into domain-driven design, getting to know all of the practices, some of the patterns, all the ideas, I think that was probably the hardest path that I personally had to walk through. It involved a lot of discussion, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of insecurity, and uh, also sometimes even heated discussions with some of my colleagues at InnoQ. And uh, so basically what I'm presenting here is my, my personal current understanding of the topic. I may be wrong in, in many, many uh, ways, so I'm always very, very keen to hear some feedback, uh, your insights, and so on and so forth. But I think currently I'm at a state where I say um, most of the, the explanations that I have for the patterns shouldn't be too wrong. Yeah, but as we, we are always continuously learning, continuously moving onward, uh, with getting a better understanding. Um, let's see how it goes. Yeah, so my name is Michael. Um, I'm from Germany, based in Nuremberg. Um, I, well, I wrote, uh, I'm currently writing a book on LeanPub about domain driven design. Progress is slower than I expected it to be, but constant. And just a little disclaimer, what I always like to do or like to do very often in talks that I give, uh, I, I want to give you a little bit of an expectation management, what you can expect in that talk. So basically, um, I assume that most of you have heard a little bit about bounded context, about uh, subdomains, about domain models, the why an integration of systems is sometimes necessary or required, but you don't need to be an expert in those things. Today I will talk about everything surrounding context maps, except for technical stuff. I will not talk about pros and cons of RESTful resources, web services, Apache Kafka, microservices, or other technical stuff. I'll also not address some correlation between context maps and collaborative modeling techniques or, so, or something like that. So if you're still happy with that, stick with me. If you say, oh, I expected something totally different, um, I think the other talks are also three minutes in. Uh, if you're totally um, baffled, so, oh no, uh, that's not for me, F absolutely fair enough. So um, I want to kick off with um, two initial slides, um, which I found, which contain a, a two quotes, and Nick Tune was actually uh, the person who brought me to those quotes, so all props to Nick for that. The first one is from the, from the book Accelerate which is a study, uh, uh, absolutely fantastic book, which uh, evaluated what highly performing delivery organizations are doing. And one of their findings was that, on the one hand, we need a loosely coupled software architecture, but on the other hand, yeah, there needs to be some organizational aspects that map on top of that architecture, because that's a pretty good predictor for continuous delivery performance and also for being able to scale organization and technological stuff in a sort of linear fashion. Um, another finding was from a study by McKinsey. So that what they found out that a lot of, especially large enterprises, when, when they are struggling to meet their goals for more modern application landscapes, for digitalization, uh, how, how this horrible term is coined at the moment, that their top hurdle is actually organizational stuff. So in a sort of a way, we need to address some organizational things. And this is one of the things where the context map actually comes into play, where it is able to gain, uh, to actually add a lot of insights yeah, to, to improve things. 
and this is what I'm going to talk about. A quick, 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 quick recap about some of this stuff where I mentioned you don't need to be an expert, but you should know a little bit about it. So basically, when we identify a problem domain, we, we dissect it to subdomains, and sometimes if we ha look here, that's for a mortgage loan application, for instance, we have some, some team working on loan applications, on a scoring engine, on, on credit decisions, on contracting, and so on. But they all rely on, on one central thing, that's this loan application form. So, so for those of you who have done a, a mortgage loan um, recently or in their past, they know this beast is complex. So usually that's four to six pages, and yeah, the complexity stems from a couple of those stakeholders to it. Now, if we would build a central domain model, uh, we would be into trouble. Yeah, we, we all know that. So that's the reason why we, we realized very early on in the domain-driven design community that we can actually look for linguistic differences yeah, regarding that loan application form. So one team talks really about the form, Others, they don't think about the form, they think about rule clusters for persons, a monthly financial situation, stuff like that. Others, yeah, they, they, they don't think about the loan application form. They say, ah, in order to make a, a, a decision template for our C-level that they can decide if they want to grant you a credit over a, a million euros or not, um, they, they don't want to look through six pages with a lot of detailed data, so they have something like a decision template. Or and finally, we have something like a contract proposal or a contract. So basically, in the domain-driven design community, we'll drill this stuff down to a bounded context, which is a linguistic boundary around the meaning of a model. So we go ahead and dissect a subdomain into various bounded contexts. What we want to achieve with that is a loose coupling on a model level. We, we, we can't work with no coupling there. So what we still need is a coupling between those bounded contexts. In order to generate a value, an additional value, we need to go ahead and understand where do we have connecting points. Because somehow, for instance, the information from the loan application form needs to go into the calculations and the checks of the rule engine of the scoring. So there needs to be some degree of coupling. And coupling can be manifold. And there can be many, many types, many sorts of coupling. Um, we can have a coupling of teams, how they talk to each other, how they work with each other. Yeah, this is on an organizational level. We can have coupling of teams through uh, institutionalized meetings that they are sitting in. Yeah? Um, we can have a coupling of the software. This is something that we, uh, or especially technical folks, very, very often look into. Um, or we can have a coupling of business capabilities. So for instance, in Germany, we have a, a credit agency called the Schufa, and they, they know a lot about us. Yeah? So they, they gather a lot of information, and when a bank asks them, how credit worthy is Michael? Um, they give you a quote, hey, the repayment probability of Michael is probably around, let's say, 94%. So if I have a rule in the scoring that says, ah, the credit worthiness of the Shufa equals the points that I give to this loan application in my scoring, I couple on the level of business capabilities. And the context map goes ahead and tries to give us a very holistic overview over the, all those kinds of coupling. So it's not just about technical aspects. Actually, the context map doesn't talk about technical coupling aspects a lot. Yeah, there are nuances in there. Basically, in the end, it runs down to a contact point of one team or system or bounded contact to another team with systems bounded, a bounded contact. And this re relationship can be on quite a few levels. Let's take a look. As I mentioned, the Shufa is a, a very central, very prominent, important credit agency um, in Germany. So some bank may call a web service of the Shufa. Yeah, so they are, they are calling them and, and tell them, hey, give me a quote about Michael. 
Or some other bounded context is submitting, publishing some domain events which another system is consuming. Yeah, uh, The typical pops up kind of thing, what we have. That's one perspective. Most software architects love this perspective. Haven't we all, all not seen offices with large printed papers with a lot of arrows, arrows on them, boxes and lines? This system consumes service X of another system and big pieces of paper that want to signal we deal with complexity. Yeah? And I've never seen someone working with it, or rarely. The next thing that we can look into is when I, for instance, call this web service of the Shufa, they answer in their part of their domain model. So basically that percentage, together with some warning messages, some negative remarks, for instance, yeah, they answer in that thing. What do I do with the result? Do I pull that into my bounded context completely without modifying? Someone's shaking his head. Yeah? Maybe. Yeah? A lot of them, a lot of uh, existing application landscapes do exactly that. So they, they take this external model and it propagates to another bounded context or another system, for instance. The same can happen with domain events. Let's not be blind here. Yeah? Of course, event-based architectures help a lot in terms of decoupling, but there is no way. So if the credit application is part of the event's payload, yeah? so if it's very big, chunky events, I've seen a couple of those. If this is a good idea, that's, on another, that's another discussion. And this system just pulls the payload from the event into their model as well the model propagates as well? Or do they translate it to something different? Both of those things can be found in code. The next thing can't be found in code. What about the communication of teams? So let's say the Shufa says, hey, we'll, ch we'll adjust the interface and the underlying model with the next release. The banks are helpless. They need to comply with that change if they like it or not. Because the, the Shufa is the one who is the key driver there. So all they can do is, yeah, mm, okay, send us the documentation. We need to take care of that. That's one point of dealing with that. The other point is a, is a different scenario. So one team says, hey, by the way, um, we'll deprecate that domain event and we'll replace it with a new one. And the other team says, hmm, that's a nice idea, but listen, we have no time, we have no budget, the risk is too high, you can't do that. And if you do that, I'm going to escalate that to the senior management. And by the way, I'm very good friends with our boss, so you lose. So they, they can basically block those other folks yeah, in, in doing that change. You can't see that kind of relationship in the code. The last scenario is that actions of one team can have an impact on other teams. So, for instance, the Shufa says, hey, by the way, we will replace the web service that we have with restful resources. The amazement of the banks is like that. Yeah? <laughs> it's non-existent. Yeah? So, th th they can do yeah, whatever they want. They can shout around. They have no chance. So, basically, their actions have a direct impact on the other teams. And those are scenarios that you can actually address or make explicit with a context map. Most of those, of those politics, of this communication, of the, those team dynamics, they are invisible. They are implicitly hidden most of the time in an organization. And this is where the context map comes into play. And um, in many parts of the domain-driven design literature, there is a different uh, a differentiation between three sorts of relationships between teams. The one is teams are mutually dependent. Uh, for those of you who work in large enterprise organizations, yeah, they, you, you know how that feels. Yeah? You have those big release dates three times a year, two times a year, four times a year, with a lot of organizations where many teams need to coordinate their efforts in order to roll out some change to production. 
those teams are mutually dependent. So if one of the teams fails, there's a high risk that the whole release fails. The other extreme is free. So there is no direct relationship between those teams. So there is no need for coordination, for meetings. Um, there is no relationship towards success or failure between those teams. So basically, we don't see a, a strong link between those teams. <coughs> Sorry about my voice. I'm struggling a bit with my voice sometimes. I had a cold last week. Um, the third kind of relationship is an upstream-downstream relationship. So basically, actions of one team can have a direct impact on another team. So basically, the upstream team yeah, is the leader. Whatever they do cascades to the downstream team. Let me give you a very simple example. Where does this term get originated from? It got originated from rivers. So I come from the city of Nuremberg in Germany, and there is a river going through it. It's called the Pegnitz. And the Pegnitz flows to our neighbor city called Fürth. Now, um, Nuremberg is upstream, and Fürth is downstream. So, for those of you who are, for instance, into soccer or football or however you call it, you may know that the relationship between the, the fans of the football club in Nuremberg and the one with the football club in Fürth is a little bit shaky. Yeah, there is a strong rivalry. So, one thing that the, um, the, the, the fans of Nuremberg can do, they can say, ah, let's be nice to them. And, and think about that as a domain model. So we put a small boat on the Pegnitz and put 10 cases of the best Franconian beer on it. Now, and think about that as in terms of a domain model. So basically the domain model goes from the upstream to the downstream, and the downstream team, which is the city of Fürth, they say, oh, that's a nice domain model. I'm going to consume it with a lot of pleasure. The more realistic thing, however, is that the fans of the FC Nuremberg will put a lot of trash in the Pignitz. Yeah? And you have a trash domain model floating down that river, and the, the folks in fruit, they are helpless. Yeah? What can they do? Yeah? Maybe there is something they can do. So the mayor could call up the mayor of Nuremberg and tell them, hey, is that really necessary? Seriously? Um, but no one gives them a guarantee about if that is successful. So basically, those are the relationships of the team. Now, the context map in domain-driven design is basically made up of a couple of patterns. Yeah? Those patterns have been written down in the books by Eric Evans, Vaughan Vernon, and they have put them in there. Basically, er Eric started with seven patterns, Vaughan added another two to them, that's the big ball of mud and the partnership. Yeah? And the interesting thing is, those patterns cover a very, very diverse set of those things that I've just been talking about. And now give me a chance to walk you through every single one of those patterns, and after that we'll consolidate them into a big picture and play a little a game then after that. I'll show you some context maps and you need to tell me where the problem is. So. Let's start off with one of the patterns. That's the open host service. This is a pattern which is pretty easy to understand. So in the end, you could say that the open host service is something like a public API. So that's an interface that a system or a team provides, which is tailored for, I would say, mass usage. So it's not a specific interface for you and a specific interface for you and a specific one for you. No, I have just one interface, and it's take it or leave it. Yeah? You can integrate with it, fair enough. If you don't want to integrate with it, do something else. Yeah? So it's, it's not about point-to-point -point APIs here. So the, the, the aim is to provide a general purpose access to a subset of the functionality of a, of a system or of a bounded context, so to speak. Um, the team which is providing the open host service is basically always on the upstream because they have a lot of power. 
I have never seen a scenario where I would say that an open host service is a credible downstream. If you have an example for that, I'd be very happy to hear about that. Um, so what you can do if you want to draw context maps on a whiteboard or some flip charts or something like that, this is something that I've seen quite a bit over the last months and years. This notation, so open host service, is abbreviated as OHS. It's also, for instance, in Vaughan's book, um, and um, U and D stand for upstream, downstream. I've al also seen folks drawing arrow, arrows, arrows as upstream, downstream. Uh, I think that's a little bit difficult, because most of the time when folks See, read something like that. They say this system is calling that system, or this bounded context is calling that bounded context, but it's not about a call relationship. So I usually avoid that yeah, when, I when I work with upstream downstream semantic. Now, in the downstream, the, team, the teams down there, they get a model through the open host service, and they can work with it. They can be a conformist, for instance. So what does that mean? So what we have here, we have a combination of an open host service in the upstream with a conformist in the downstream. So the credit application domain model propagates directly without any changes towards the other bounded context, which is scoring. So and, and please um, take that very seriously. I, I would say it propagates on a language level. Yeah, so if you have, for instance, a technical stub that you generated out of a Swagger, REST thing, web service stub, or whatever, it's not important, uh, and you just translate this one to your own uh, thing, and you have customer, set name, brackets, web service customer, get name. Customer, set address, service customer, get address. You're still a conformist. Yeah, it's, that's a, just a technical model shoving some, somehow. Now, the motivation. Most of you will probably think that being a conformist is totally stupid. I think so. Some of you um, will probably say, ah, that's a very tight coupling. But the motivation can be manifold. One kind of motivation can be force. Yeah, especially if you look, for instance, at insurance companies. I know a couple of insurance companies which still love, for reasons I, I really don't understand, centralized enterprise data models. They make you conform to that central model. You can do whatever you want. You will lose that escalation. There is no way around it. Or if you use commercial APIs, there may be TOCs that tell you you're not allowed to modify, enhance, or whatever part of that model that you're getting from them. Or your motivation can simply be laziness. Ah, oh, that thing, that's good enough to drink water. Why transfer it to something else? I'll take that. That's one motivation. Or you can be totally amazed by the model you get. I have once built a a great conformist. Um, together with a friend of mine, um, we started an online music magazine 20 years ago. And that m music magazine is all about punk music, heavy metal music, long-haired, tattooed folks who make a lot of noise. So our readers um, love going to concerts. So they want concert information on our site. Now, um, one thing is you do not want to enter that stuff manually. It's hell on earth. Yeah, because one band sends German day times, the other one sends UK day times, and so on and so forth. So we integrated with an open host service, which provided us with concert information. And they had a great model. That model supported three-day festivals, tours, festival tours, one-off shows, and whatever. Perfect. My database model was based on them. My view model was based on them. My business logic model was based on their model, and it worked like a until they stopped the web service. So I needed a, a new open host service for that. Now, what could I do? I could rewrite 
my whole concert data uh, base and all that stuff and, and all the logic that surrounded it. Um, or I could say, that's my model now. And I use an anti-corruption layer when I go to a new service and I just transform that model. So I do a translation of the models. And so I basically, the anti-corruption layer goes ahead, gets an external model in, and transforms it and translates it to your own specialized domain model. Now, there is still coupling on the external model from the other bounded context. That still exists, but it's basically limited to this thing up there and not to the code base, to the core of your domain model, which we want to have as highly expressive as possible. One thing, um, who is working a lot with Legacy monoliths that are really rough. Yeah, you, you all know the next pattern, the shared kernel. Yeah, so most of the legacy monoliths from the gates of hell, they, they run on this stuff. So it's basically the shared kernel is something like a, a shared artifact between two teams. So can, can you grab that for a moment? So basically we're holding a shared kernel, the both of us. So when I pull, he's flying over there. When he pulls, I'm flying into the crowd. So basically, the shared kernel is something that two teams physically share, something like a shared database schema. Hello, ugly monolith. Yeah? Um, or a shared jar file, a shared DLL, or something like that. So that's an artifact. Sometimes there may be a reason for having a shared kernel. I wouldn't call it an anti-pattern per se. But use it with caution. Yeah? This can become very toxic in a very short amount of time, especially when external vendors, politics, and so on and so forth come into play. So that's basically the share kernel. When you have a share kernel, those teams, they are mutually dependent. There's no way around it. And when you have mutually dependent teams, you want them to build a partnership. So they need to coordinate their efforts. Yeah? So when one team decides to change something, to adjust something, the other team says, OK, we need to coordinate those steps. Yeah? We need to go step by step. It's hard to do independent releases of bounded contexts um, when, you, when you have a shared kernel. Yeah? You need to coordinate the testing, the efforts, the rollout, and so on and so forth. Now, those of you who have done a mortgage loan with a bank, you were cursing about the complexity of that form, weren't you? Do you think it's the responsibility, the complexity is the responsibility of the team who is responsible for the sales funnel? Probably not, because their motivation would be as small information as possible. We want to drive up our conversion rate. Yeah? We want to sell as much as possible. It's basically the scoring team that tells the others, hey, listen, you, in order to perform a proper scoring, you need to go ahead and add this stuff, this stuff, this stuff, this stuff to this form and give it to us. And they need to comply. The context map calls this kind of relationship a customer-supplier relationship. So usually, in an upstream-downstream relationship, the downstream team is sort of helpless. But with the customer-supplier relationship, we give them a little bit of an influence over the upstream. And scoring and an application sales funnel, they have an upstream-downstream relationship. Without loan applications, there is no scoring. Whereas scoring can do whatever they want, they won't have an effect on the, on the, on the, on the sales funnel, for instance. So basically, the other team has to comply to that. This is a power relationship. In the, in the perfect sense of the pattern, yeah, this is a very controlled process. But it can be abused. And I call that then the vetoing customer. That's the customer that says, Sorry, you can't change, we have no time. Sorry, the risk is too high, and so on and so forth. So basically, that's a customer-supplier relation. Another extreme is separate ways. It means that 
two bounded contexts have no real connection to each other. Sometimes integration is too expensive. Sometimes, and this is a very interesting thing, you want to build a minimum viable product. Yeah, or a solution or something like that. And you say, well, that integration, that might be nice, but it's not necessary for the MVP. We can go with an um, organizational solution. We do with manual processes and see how the business scales. We can see how the business goes. If it goes well, we can still add more features. We can still toss the separate ways away and go for an integration later on. Think about that in terms of uh, separate ways. If you look at existing landscapes, for instance, in call center applications, what you very often have in call center applications is a scenario where the call center agents is in one application or in one bounded context. They copy some information. They change to a different bounded context or application. And they paste that information in there or they do manual double work. I think when I plan transformations or modernizations, I want to know about those. And they are very often hidden. This gives them a name. Another very interesting thing is the published language. Who of you has accepted a calendar invite on their smartphone? Probably everyone. You, you, you had your pop-up, and you said, accept, decline. You've been interacting with a published language. iCalendar. Or you send contact information through Threema, iMessage, however those services are called. Yeah? They're based on a published language as well. iCalendar. Or in the banking industry, in Europe, or especially Germany, there is a standard for digital invoicing called Zugfert. So, this is a, a standard which is defined very often through an RFC and in a format where single teams can translate into and out of it. There will be a small set of the teams who sit together and discuss about that standard. So for instance, let's take vCard, I think Apple should be in there, Samsung, Google, but the team of Fairphone will probably not have a seat in there but they can still use it in the exchange with other teams, with other bounded contexts. So this is a, a very powerful thing, which is often, very often also combined with the open host service. So some open host service is answering and is working based on unpublished language. But I think uh, the literature is a little bit unclear right there. Uh, for instance, Vaughan Vernon in his books, he, he in every diagram with an open host service, he mentioned published language. And I think my personal opinion is, my expectation to an open host service is that it has a well-defined interface. Yeah, I think every open host service, service should have that. And I think the difference to the published language is that a couple of teams agree on a certain model in terms of a consortium or something like that. Yeah, I think there's the difference. My personal opinion, I may be wrong. If you have a different opinion, I'm very in keen and interested to hear about that. So the last pattern has been introduced to the domain driven design world by Vaughan Vernon. It's the big ball of map. Basically, this is a characteristic of a part of a system or a part of a model which is absolutely lousy. Yeah, which is totally ugly, there are no clear boundaries, no clear relationships, and most of the time, these things have a tendency to sprawl, to spread uh, through an application landscape or through a system like cancer. Yeah? So um, what you want to have is, this is basically your warning sign. I don't think you want to have a shared kernel with a big ball of mud. I don't think you want to be a conformist against a big ball of mud. Yeah? What you want to have is security in terms of an anti-corruption layer against a big ball. So, <coughs> as you've seen, those patterns are really... Yeah, they address a lot of different things. 
So when, when, when I, um, and this is something that is basically not in any of the domain-driven design books. Um, when, I, when I take a look at those patterns and I try to apply some categories to them, I can say that some of those patterns directly address team relationships, like the partnership, customer supplier, separate ways, or a published language. Others address a lot uh, about model propagation, stuff like the conformist, stuff like the anti-corruption uh, anti layer, um, the shared kernel, but also to a certain degree, a little bit separate ways and the published language. And then we have some, I, I didn't have a better name. If you have a better one, I'm, I'm very glad to hear about that. API sort of technical stuff like the open host service. I heard some folks that say open host service is also a very social pattern in terms of a team relationship. Um, the shared kernel also has a sort of a technical nature to it because it's a shared physical artifact. And definitely the big ball of mud, which is a, a quality of a, a part of a model or a system. Now, some of those patterns, especially the ones with the team relationships, they also play into those three categories of team relationships. So mutually dependent partnership and shared kernel. Free, separate ways and published language. Two teams that are working based on iCal, they don't need to talk to each other. They don't need to synchronize on each other. They just say, we run on iCal and that's it. Or upstream, downstream, customer supplier, anti-corruption layer, conformist, open host service and so on. But that's not very sharp in terms of the differentiation. I think you can be, you can have an anti-corruption layer against a published language, for instance. As long as you communicate with others in the published language, you can internally do whatever you want. There's also a sort of a relationship to Conway's law there. So published language re doesn't require a lot of communication between teams, especially when they use it. That doesn't mean about the consortium that's driving it, but um, as, as long as it's clear that from a Samsung Android phone through an iOS Apple phone. It's iCalendar that we're working with. There's no need for communication. But a shared kernel, for instance, requires a lot of communication. So this is a lot. Uh, this has a lot to do with that stuff. And the nice thing about the context map is that you can take on different perspectives on those things. Let's take this thing. This diagram has nothing to do with the context map so far. It's a core relationship. System Y is calling some service from system ABC. But I can introduce the first few in terms of team relationships. So there's an upstream downstream relationship. So it's basically clear that Y is helpless and ABC is the king or the queen. Now the next thing is, I can drill down into an API level. So we have the open. I can drill down into a model propagation. I can see, ah, okay, against the open host service. There's an I'm a conformist. Or I can even drill down further into a second level of the team relationship. Which kind of relationship is that? Is that a customer supplier relationship? And now just a quick question. Do you really want a customer supplier relationship against an open No, actually not. Do you see that in the reality quite often? Sometimes, yeah. Not, not, not of some team integrating against the Google Maps API, yeah? But inside of an organization, when politics come into play, I have a couple of uh, examples for you. So basically, this thing is a real-world example from a, a mid-sized company in Regensburg, Bavaria. And I'm working together with uh, one of their team leads for quite some time now. And we have a really good relationship. And one day at lunch, she was utterly free. I'm totally fed up. Nothing is going forward anymore. Every time someone is complaining that this is not possible, that is not comp possible, I'm totally fed up with this shit organization. That's what she said. I was like, oh, okay, interesting. Uh, 
what can we do about that? And we, we were discussing back and forth. And we came to the idea, let's draw a context map. And that came out. So basically, we had one team which provided an open host service, and other systems were integrating against it. Uh, so with an anti-corruption layer, anti-corruption layer, anti-corruption. For the teams of X and Y, for those two teams over there, the integration was super important. Um, the integration, uh, they, they, they really generated an additional, an add-on value based on that integration. For set, it wasn't important at all. Now, what we found out, however, when, when the open host service changed something, when they moved to a new version, X and Y have always been, yeah, that's cool, that's great, that's a good idea, let's do that. But set was very often raising the We are with the riskiest. Some of my folks called in. And what's the effect? What does that mean? Yeah. Why? Exactly. That, 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 that was her, yeah? Yeah? That's the solution. That's the solution. Let's stick to the problem. Exactly. And that's what she asked me. Hey, are you currently telling me that set is blocking X and Y? I was like, yes. And she looked at me with fury in her eyes and, and yelled across the table, this rat! <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> you seem to be really pissed. What's going on? It turned out that the managers of X, Y, and Z, one of them was, was about to be promoted. And Z was playing political foul play. Yeah? He's all, he was always running around in the organization. Oh, we don't have a problem. We can release anytime we want. It's always the others. They can't release. So, very interesting thing. Yeah? You don't see that in an enterprise architecture diagram. Or this context map. What do you think? Let's say we want uh, to exchange the credit agency from the Shufa to Arvato Infos. What do we need to change? Take a look. There's a risk that the model of the credit agency propagates through the conformist into scoring, and then there is a rest risk. The part of that model is in the share kernel and propagates to the next. And the same risk exists for the. I call this example the model problem. Um, let me show you a couple of further examples. Um, those are taken from my book. Um, and so you can basically give influence to teams. So what we have here is um, we have an upstream-downstream re relationship between the bounded context, application registration, and verification, and real estate assessment and scoring. But those two bounded contexts, they need to have an influence about the stuff that is in the form. So they can have a customer-supplier relation. Usual stuff. The next thing is more interesting. Because it's uh, an example, which shows why a conformist doesn't always have to be a bad idea. Um, what we have here is a credit decision, which is downstream to many other teams. Yeah, so they gather a decision template from various resources and they compile ideas for a credit decision from the scoring, from the real estate assessment, from the loan application form, and they pass it to their C-level on a one-pager. Hey, do you want to do that or not? Now, one thing that we could do is we could say this is a very important team. So we make that, for instance, a core subdomain. But I degraded this one 
to a supporting or even a generic Now, do you want to have a custom supplier relationship from a generic subdomain to a core subdomain? I don't think it's a pretty good idea. So what we tell them by, by telling them you are conformist against the, in, uh, the real estate assessment and the scoring is that we trust those teams. So basically, you can do whatever you want with the scoring result and with the real estate assessment, but you're not changing it. You don't get any influence. You can simply display it. That's all you can do. So we are basically degrading the influence of that with the conformist. So that can be a pattern, which pattern can come in handy in such situations. So it doesn't always need to be a bad idea. Or also the published language for the loan application form. That can be a pretty good published language candidate because many bounded contexts need this stuff. So we need to decide which teams need to have an influence on it. They need to decide on a format. They decide on it. And other teams, they can just use it. Yeah? So there's no need to have <coughs> an extra discussion on it. Now, when credit decision, let's say, is a generic subdomain, I wouldn't put them into influence on the published language. They can simply use it when they want. Dealing with a big ball of mud, yeah? every course banking system, which I have seen so far, is basically the definition of a big ball of mud. Yeah? So every single one. I've never seen a core banking system uh, which I wouldn't qualify as something like that. Uh, so um, what you want to have is you want to have a lot of anti-corruption layers against. Uh, so you want to protect that this model doesn't sprawl into the rest of your bounded context. So this sets up the boundaries. Now to sum it up, context maps help us with governance issues. Yeah, we can define ideas for a governance. But we can also visualize existing governance processes that are implicitly hidden. We can see where politics are being played when we apply those ideas to existing organizations, teams, systems, application landscapes. We can see how bad models are propagating from one bounded context to another. And this gives us a very powerful tool for planning IT transformations and modernization. I've used that quite a few times when, when customers came to me and said, ah, how do we want to modernize those? I said, you need to be aware how, how the relationships are, how the things are tangled. This can be one way of doing that. So in my eyes, I think the context map, extremely powerful tool. It's a little bit of underrated in terms of the awareness of the domain-driven design community right now. And um, so if you want to discuss a couple of those ideas, your own experiences with me, I'm around till tomorrow in the evening. Hit me up in a lunch break or at a coffee break, and I'm happy to talk to you. Thank you very much. <laughs>